So the speaker is Hannah Hogarson from the University of Maryland. And she, she is going to speak to us about big out of bed and its course geometry. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thanks for coming. Um, this is my first uh, talk of the semester. So diving back in. Um, yeah. Uh, so the yeah, so Elizabeth's talk was probably a, a nice um, a nice prequel because we're going to talk about some of the same ideas. Um, and so first, let me just tell you uh, three of the main papers I'm pulling stuff from here. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, so we were talking about the mapping class group and this recent rise in the study of big mapping class groups, right? So I want to start with uh, just like, so the mapping class group, like a lot of times in GGT, we're studying these groups where we have an object, we have some type of notion of symmetry, and then we want to say, like, when are, when are two symmetries the same, right? So the mapping class group is we're looking at surfaces, and we're studying orientation preserving homeomorphisms on the surface, and we want to say that two of these should be like the same thing if they're equivalent up to homotopy. Right. And in the finite type setting, uh, a lot of times we are drawing these analogies with out Fn, which is the group um, so of outer automorphisms of free groups. So what that means is the object we're studying are free groups of finite rank. And the types of symmetries we want to look at are automorphisms. And we're saying that two are the same if they're the same up to conjugacy. So that's what the out part means, right? So we're modding out conjugate um, inner automorphisms are your conjugacy automorphisms, and we're modding out by those elements. Right? And then we've had this recent rise in interest in big mapping class groups, where now our object are these infinite type surfaces. And the uh, symmetries are still homeomorphisms, orientation preserving, usually, right? You can study new interesting groups by like maybe getting rid of that orientation preserving or restricting or expanding your type of surfaces you're interested in, like asking about what types of boundary they have, which we're just, you know, not focusing on that. And then still looking at up to homotopy. And so the question is that, you know, when these two fields like to like, get together and one side proves something, so the other side wants to prove the analogous thing. What is, how do I change things over here if I want to add a big, yeah? Um, so uh, my understanding of the story is that this is this is literally the story. People were like, well, well, what about big out FN? And so you go find Miladin and Yael and you ask them, well, what's big out FN? And um, maybe if you're not them, your first guess as to what big out FN would be is, does anyone want to guess? Like, how do I take out FN and make it infinite? Make that N go to infinity? Yeah, look at out F infinity. Oh, whoops, I've kind of got it written at the bottom. And that's like a cool group. It's one group. And, um, it has this property, though, that it's coarsely bounded, which is this notion Elizabeth introduced. We're going to talk about it a lot more in a bit. Um, oops, out of infinity. So this is a great first guess, and it's an interesting group. Um, but so this is with uh, George Domat. He's at Rice University, and Sung Hoon Kwok, who's at the University of Utah. Um, this uh, summer, we showed that the groups ought F infinity and out F infinity are coarsely bounded. Uh, so for now, we'll just say that that means that they don't actually have very interesting uh, global geometry. Um, so you're like, well, this is not very satisfying. And so you go ask Milad and Yael, what, what is big out FN? And they tell you that maybe the first, that the right, the right object Oh, sorry, let me, um, they'll tell you the answer, but this is how they thought of the answer, is first let's ignore that word big, right? And reframe the group out FN, right? Another way to study the group out FN is to study locally finite graphs of rank N. And you're studying um, 
symmetries, which are proper homotopy equivalences, and up to proper homotopy. Okay, so really, yeah. Um, and so what do we do if I wanna get rid of that word big, or I wanna introduce the word big, I'm now gonna say locally finite graphs. I'm gonna get rid of this of rank N, locally finite infinite graphs. Becomes my new way to turn. So let me just remind you, right, that uh, so here's an example of an element in out F2, where um, I'm thinking about F2 as being the fundamental group of a graph of rank two. Yeah. And I am thinking about the group automorphism, A maps to AB and B maps to B inverse. So these are the generators of the group. And um, what that is the induced map on pi one of the graph map, um, which is a homotopy equivalence that takes this loop A, so these points, and maps them around the loops A, B, and takes that loop B, this is the purple, and like switches the direction. Okay, so these are the types of maps we're going to be studying, but now we're going to make our graphs bigger. Okay, so here is I did this poorly. That's fine. So here is that definition, but written in a concise way. So we're going to say for gamma, a locally finite, but probably infinite graph. Um, we're going to look at the group of proper homotopy equivalences up to homot proper homotopy. And I just want to point out that part of the definition of being a proper homotopy equivalence is that your inverse homotopy equivalence is also proper. So you can have uh, uh, like a map of a graph uh, that's a homotopy equivalence where one, like if you just look at one of them, it's proper, but its inverse map isn't proper. Um, anyway, we don't need to worry about that much. And what's great is that these types of infinite, I'm going to call these infinite type graphs. So they're always locally finite, but they're infinite. This does not mean infinite rank. Um, they're classified by their rank and their end space in just the same way that those big surfaces we were just looking at are. And so this end space, again, uh, keeps track of two different types of ends, ends that are um, accumulated by loops and ends which are not. So that means that in every, like, it's kind of a way to walk out to infinity on my graph. And I'm asking, do I keep seeing uh, rank in my local fundamental group of these pieces? Uh, better explained with the picture, right? So here are two examples of uh, locally finite, but infinite graphs, because I drew dot, dot, dots at the end. And so this first graph up top, I'm thinking of like just a line where, you know, maybe at every integer point, I've attached a loop. And so this guy has two loops, two ends, sorry, an end on the left, and an end on the right, and they're each accumulated by loops. And then the other kind of type is my second graph. It doesn't have any rank, but I have this infinite branching. And so I have a Cantor set of ends, none of which are accumulated by loops. And you know, I could have oops, some type of boop, combination of these things. Um, I could have one of those ends in the Cantor set accumulated by loops, many of them. So if you're used to big infinite type surfaces, you're just replacing your genus with loops here, basically. All right? Um, and you like you can do like a word for word change in the, the uh, classification. And the classification is up to proper homotopy. Okay, so a little bit more about this group. It fits into this short exact sequence where um, any mapping class group will induce an action on the ends, right? So maybe I'm doing some type of switch between these and it's like scrambling these ends. And so I'm getting an induced map on the homeomorphism group of the end space, which, which cares about whether those ends are accumulated by loops or not. And the kernel of that uh, map is what we call the pure mapping class group. So again, this is an analogy with the surface setting. and 
So we think about these are just the ones that, like geometrically, these are the ones that fix the ends. And this is a topological group. Oh. <laughs> I'm struggling. There we go. It is not finitely generated. So that's like, again, we're starting to think, okay, we're geometric group theorists. We've got a cool group. I want to study it. I'm not finitely generated. I'm not compactly generated either. And then the saving piece of information is that our group is Polish, which means that um, it's a complete metric space. Do I need separable in there also? Yeah, okay, separable. Um, but I'm not gonna work with it directly. Really what I'm gonna use are uh, these great tools of Christian Rosendahl. Um, so this, this part is coming from his new book, Course Geometry of Topological Groups, um, where he introduces this no notion of course boundedness. Uh, so we say a subset of a group, of a Polish group is coarsely bounded if for any continuous action of that group on a metric space, uh, the diameter of any of the orbits of the action under A is finite, or we have this other equivalent definition down here, which I'm, which I call Rosendahl's criterion. And I'm including just to show you that there's also a way of dealing with this definition without like thinking about every single group action that the group admits. And really, sometimes we get extra lucky. And this first one also tells us that if I can just find a continuous group homomorphism to Z, from my group, then that group is not globally coarsely bounded, right? Because Z acts on itself with un unbounded orbits, right? So I really said for a subset of a group, and I'm going to be thinking about, well, when that subset is the entire group, or when that subset is a neighborhood, or when that subset is a generating set. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what Elizabeth told us. This is why we care. Um, as geometric group theorists, is because if our groups locally CB with a CB generating set, then we have a well-defined quasi-isometry type, right? And now we're happy. Um, yeah. So what uh, George Sunghoon and I did as well is we classified the graphs gamma for which their pure mapping class group is coarsely bounded, right? And that falls into these three cases. If the rank of the graph is zero, um, if the rank is, if the graph is this one exact particular graph, it's got a loop and a ray. Or this kind of more interesting case, what does this say? I have one end accumulated by loops. And when I delete that end from the end space, the rest of the end space is discrete. Okay. So, uh, Elizabeth also mentioned that Mann and Rafi classified these surfaces as well, right? Which is great because I uh, had a longer version of this talk where I had it all written out and I deleted it to make the talk shorter. Um, and what I just want to point out, so there's this for their full mapping class group, but that's because we know more about the decomposition. Um, but we, we can use it to also talk about the pure mapping class groups of these surfaces. And so I just want to point out that Oh, there it is. Yeah, so they do this under this mild, like this assumption of the surface being tame, which I've seen people describe as mild, but maybe Anshul will tell us later about, you know, I don't know, is it really mild? Like, we don't know. Yeah. Okay, so I'm excited about that. And um, yes, so they classify whose surfaces, which surfaces have mapping class groups that are coarsely bounded, locally coarse bounded, CB generated. And I have an example here that um, apparently I should have a magic place to click to make it appear. Okay, that's mostly it. So I want to show you an example of a like surface and it's like corresponding under the classification graph, right? So this first surface, I'm trying to draw a surface that has one end accumulated by genus and then an isolated puncture. And I'm drawing a graph that has one end accumulated by loops and one ray. So an isolated end that's not accumulated by loops. And this uh, graph down here, it's mapping class group. La, 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 I know what I did. It is coarsely bounded, 
but this guy up here, it's mapping class group is not class group. So it's not the same classification. We are able to pull like some of their techniques and use them in different ways. Um, but it really ended up being like, like so far, like I've told you like, oh, it's the same, it's the same, it's the same. It's not the same anymore. Okay. So let's talk about that. Like, uh, yeah. So here is just like a flow chart that encapsulates our theorem. So like this is, I said, we classified. And so you follow this around and, um, you know, we're really not going to talk about a lot of this, but we're going to talk about that third case that I wrote. If you have one end accumulated by loops and then the rest of your end space is discrete, let me show you a couple examples of these graphs. Um, they're both my like favorites and least favorites. Favorites because uh, we gave them cute drawings and names. So if I have one end accumulated by loops um, and then finally many other ends, one way to draw that graph is something like this. We call these hungry Loch Ness monsters. So maybe you've seen a picture of a Loch Ness monster surface. We also have Loch Ness monster graphs. And those isolated rays are her tongues. And she's very hungry. And then the other way, the other way to satisfy this is, right, I have instead of the rays um, being totally isolated and having finitely many of them, if I have infinitely many rays, that accumulate to the same end accumulated by loops, then I'm drawing them like little legs of my millipede monster. This was the last class of graphs we figured out, um, like how to classify. Uh, so that's that's also what makes them monsters. Um, and they that like work led us to some other cool stuff. So yeah, so these guys have coarsely bounded mapping class group. Um, and what happens like if, I mean, almost the same case, but my my ends not accumulated by loops. I still have one end accumulated by loops, but the other ones are not discrete. So here's the simplest example of that. Um, I have those infinitely many rays and there's an accumulation point at the end, yeah? In this class of graphs, I can define a length function, which um, let's just look at the, I mean, don't even look at the blue part. Let me just tell you that a length function is some type of continuous function that has some nice properties like the length of an element is the same as its inverse, the length of the identity is zero. I satisfy some type of triangle inequality, right? Things that lengths should have. And so these types of graphs we're able to put length functions on. And actually we realized we can make these length functions really nice. We can, we can make sure their uh, image lands in Z instead of in R and uh, we actually get this like ultra triangle inequality. And together, this is kind of enough to say that this class of graphs acts continuously on a simplicial tree, um, which is cool on its own, but also it was the first step in um, showing uh, a classification of mapping classes whose of graphs whose pure mapping classes are or are not CB generated, okay? Um, so uh, actually what I should have done over here is crossed off this. I didn't actually need it anymore. Um, so that's what this flow chart is. It's another way of, right? Cause the goal is to get like which, the first goal is to say, well, which ones are CB generated? Which ones are locally CB? That means I have a, a well-defined quasi-isometry type for the experts. Sometimes one of those implies the other. Um, sometimes you don't need quite that much. And then the next goal would be like, well, what is that quasi-isometry type? Um, I'm not telling you about that yet because I don't know, but like that's, you know, the next step. That's exciting. Okay, so we've got which ones are CV generated. And um, this CV generation and Oh, sorry, this is the flowchart for which graphs have a locally CB mapping class group. Um, yeah, this is a complete classification of graphs, whether they're, and it's it's kind of like baking up my graph and using those other pieces from before, because I'm doing some type of local arguments of the same things. Um, but once I'm locally CB, CB generated, I can start talking about asymptotic dimension. Okay. 
So asymptotic dimension is like an analog of Lebesgue covering dimension, um, like looking at you know balls and overlappingnesses of them. And uh, I'm not an expert in this, but I know that the reason many people care about asymptotic dimension is we know that groups with uh, finite asymptotic dimension satisfy the Novikov conjecture, which I don't remember what that is right now, but I know that the name one of the named postdocs at Maryland is Novikov. Um, and so we were also able to show that for graphs which are locally finite and have inf have infinite rank and have a locally CB mapping class group, then we can classify their asymptotic dimension. And that asymptotic dimension is either zero or it's infinity. And this is very cool. So this is, as far as I know, these are the first like non-trivial like examples of some of these big groups where like the entire group isn't like geometrically trivial, but I have zero asymptotic dimension. Right? And we get this dichotomy and it's exactly this, this same thing that was showing up before about how many ends are accumulated by loops. Okay, so I just wanted to, I didn't wanna, yeah, dive too much into the proofs. I wanted to just tell you about like the stuff that we've done so far and introduce these graphs. And so I'll just stop there. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, any, any questions to Hannah? Yeah. Can you explain the proof? My favorite slide then. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you, yeah. Can you explain the proof very, very briefly, very shortly? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's. So we've got this giant scary flow chart. And let me tell you about how it's like parts of it are not really that scary. Okay. So I start off by just asking about the rank of my graph. And the first question is, if that rank is zero, mm -hmm. the peer mapping class was CB, but that's because the peer mapping class group is trivial. If I don't have any loops, all I have are Ns, then the peer mapping class can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So it's just the identity element in that group. Um, uh, so then the next thing I ask is about the rank being one. Yeah. Um, and I have this lasso graph. And if, oh yeah, so is the, if the rank is one, then my graph looks something like this. It's just a loop with a bunch of rays coming off. And so let's, yeah, so let's, this is a good, let's get an idea for like what these groups really look like. So one thing like this loop, if I'm thinking about how, how can I like map this, like wrap up this graph and map it on top of it, itself, what are some things I can do? I can do something like I can look at this ray and I can take that ray and I imagine just like picking it up and like wrapping it around this loop some number of times and then sending it back out. Mm -hmm. And here when I have like multiple rays coming off that yeah. like I can do this with multiple rays and they kind of get intertwined and they block each other. Mm -hmm. But if I only have one ray here, well, then there was like kind of no anchor, like holding my spool in place and it just goes, whoop, it unwinds. And so that guy doesn't really have an interesting mapping class group either. All I can do is kind of flip the orientation of the circle. Uh -huh, so this I group see. is actually uh -huh. just like a Z mod 2Z. Uh -huh. uh, and that's, that's a very small group. It's coarsely bounded. Um, but over here, uh, yeah, here you're getting these like copies of Z to the something inside by like counting these winding numbers. And in mm -hmm. here, once I have more than one loop, uh, let's draw three, uh, then I'm actually, I can kind of ignore that ray for now. And yes, all that stuff is happening, but also inside, I just see a copy of out FN. So this is something I probably should have hit on also is that this theorem we had about out F infinity being coarsely mm -hmm. bounded out Fn is not coarsely bounded for all n, um, but kind of once you have too many loops, I have like too much freedom. I can always kind of ignore uh -huh. stuff almost. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. very uh, 
connected. This is kind of, that's very, uh, you know, meta yeah. kind of or whatever, mm -hmm. but yeah. So here I'm just seeing copies of out of N mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and using mm -hmm. that. And so then we, yeah. And then, yeah. So then the other thing is, so Elizabeth talked about shift maps and that's what we use actually when I have a graph, like, let me not try and when I have at least two ends accumulated by loops, mm -hmm. I have shift maps here as well, where like in the okay. surface case, I'm marching the genus or the subsurfaces down. Here I have the same thing. I'm marching my loops down one by one, and I can kind of make a map to Z by doing a similar argument to uh, Patel, Blamis, and is there a third person on that paper where they introduce, they do the cohomology stuff. Javier Aramayona. Javier Aramayona is also on the paper. Okay, don't tell him I forgot him. Um, <laughs> where they like construct some type of flux map to like count how much shifting has happened mm -hmm. um, to build a map to Z. We do something similar here on these guys to show once I have a map to Z, now I can factor through that map to Z and get this action with unbounded orbits to show I'm not coarsely bounded. And so, yeah, so, so far all those things I told you have been pretty simple. And that leaves us with this case that I was telling you about, which are these monster graphs and um, these, these ones where I have extra accumulation points. And so that really is where a lot of the work goes in. So this, the same thing, yeah, the types of elements we see here on these monster graphs are things like this tongue can come in and it can wrap around a bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. but it can't wrap around infinitely, like infinitely many stuff because everything needs to be proper. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you, Hannah, one more time. Thanks.